Hi, I'm Ali Patterson. On this episode of Fintech Finance, we're looking at the role of AI in the customer experience. For this, we speak with Kofax, Ulster Bank, 11FS, and Parias Bank. So first, I caught up with Jim Close from Kofax to speak about how to keep customers happy in such a highly regulated atmosphere. If you're gonna put a proposition to a client, they're looking for um, significant improvement in, in the quality of a process and perhaps the productivity of a process. And the benchmark is 30%. Less than 30% people generally aren't interested. There are levels of productivity improvement we're seeing with robotic process automation that I'm actually worried about putting in front of customers because they are so significant. I mean, literally 99% improvement in throughput. If I go and take that to any, anyone, they're just going to laugh at me and say, you're, you're mad. But actually, we do have examples like that where we're getting 99% improvement in throughput. Um, so it, it's taking what it is a very simple task. Typically, somebody will sit on a screen. I mean, if you, if you look at um, the banking industry, particularly high value transactions, high net worth individuals, so the risks here are very large. You know, a bank last year was fined £70 million. Pounds for one transaction where it failed to perform the uh, AML checks properly. And now, what that bank actually used to do was, if they did a transaction like this, they, they would Google the individual to see if that individual was a person of interest. Um, so you literally have somebody with a transaction slip in front of them who is then Googling the name to see if there's anything odd about that person or anything of interest, which means that they should perhaps perform further checks. Uh, so all of that can be automated. So if, where a bank is Googling or a bank, somebody sat connecting a spreadsheet or connecting multiple systems, all of this can be automated using robotic process automation. And basically it takes out all the people, frees up the knowledge workers, and then they can go and do more productive, more profitable things for you instead. Over in Ireland, Douglas McKenzie caught up with Kieran Coyle from Ulster Bank to talk about how to maintain the human element in this digital world. We are in a transitionary phase, and it's a phase where we see customer behaviour changing rapidly. You know, I think in the last month, 65% of all of our customers' interactions with us as a bank has been digital. But to be really clear about this, we don't see this as a, is it digital or is it a human interaction? We see this in a holistic way. It's, they're not mutually exclusive we see customer physical interaction still as a cornerstone of our proposition. To enable that, we have our branches, our branch network. We've got our mortgage advice stores where people really want to talk to us at a really important time of their life. We've got our telephone banking uh, channel. We, as a subsidiary of RBS, are in a very unique position in having that capability and the scale and the capacity of a parent like RBS and bringing that to bear in our marketplace. A great example of that would be uh, RBS's various innovation hubs, the scouting networks, uh, one of which is in Silicon Valley, where they met a company called Topbox, which provides secure video messaging or video conferencing for customers, interaction with the bank. We took that and deployed it here in Ireland as the trial area for RBS, and do, uh, if you like, which is a fantastic opportunity for us and has enabled us to really bring the digital and the physical world together, where we are now doing customer mortgage applications through that channel from, they could be anywhere else in the world and we can get on with the process and make it seamless for our customers. And I think that's a really great example of where digital and physical comes together because, because I don't see the digital world and the physical world be mutually exclusive. The power is the, getting that ingredient and that mix right. And that's something that will no doubt evolve as our customers' behaviours and expectations evolve and our job is to be in step with that evolution. I caught up with David Breer from 11FS to talk about some of the challenges within customer experience. For me, I think the, you know, the, particularly in the retail space, we've seen some you know, really great uh, propositions coming to market. The, the sort of Monzo, Starlings, N26s, you know, particularly Starling in the last couple of months, those guys have really been sort of stretching their legs now with all of the things that they're bringing to market. Even global expansion, those guys are kind of moving out to. So, um, interestingly, I, I kind of see the UX within the commercial space being um, a, um, a really interesting setup, if I'm honest with you. I feel like the retail space is, is becoming incredibly um, busy, really, uh, and actually showing a lot of the, the, the big um, banking organizations where to go. You know, physically in the, um, the Monzo space, those guys have actually showed people the roadmap. So, you know, banks have got a, a really easy, you know, if these are the ingredients for, for what good UX lies like, then uh, they know what to copy. Um, I guess the challenge is now, can they?
Yeah. What about on the, on the clearing? So we've got obviously Nick, Nick's uh, cl clear bank as mm. well. Yeah, it's it's interesting. We're, we're starting to see, um, you know, the, the sort of early stages of, of the kind of development of fintech was definitely at the, the sort of presentation layer. You know, particularly in the, the US, actually, everything that we saw with Moven and Simple and these guys was, was about presentation on top of somebody else's rails. But, you know, literally, Rails Bank now, you know, what Nigel Verdon has done and Solaris Bank in Berlin and even Clear Bank in terms of what they're doing from a clearing perspective. Like, the the interesting stuff, particularly from a technology perspective, is definitely moving to the back office. Um, you know, it's where actually execution and you know, literal billions of pounds of, of savings can actually be made in the really big organisations. So yeah, it's very exciting. FinTech's definitely not just uh, skin, deep, uh, skin deep for us, so it's uh, good to see it move to the back office. I also spoke with Kofax to talk about how to use mobile technology to help onboard new customers. Well, again, everyone has got an app on a mobile and they're widely adopted, but the, the big conundrum in the industry has been, will customers use an app to engage with you for the first time? And the answer is absolutely yes, they will. Uh, this, just this morning, I, I parked at Slough Station and there was a, a, a new parking system in place. I had to download an app in order to transact. So people will download an app to transact, but there are certain aspects to modern smartphones which banks can further take advantage of. So you know its location, you probably know the owner. It's probably a verified device already on your systems. But it also has a touch screen and it also has a camera. Now what you can do is connect that camera with your back-end systems and create, in effect, a, a secure scanner. So what that means is that you can use the camera on a mobile phone to capture a document, not just collect an image of a document, but also extract the information from that document. And basically, you can uh, allow the customer to verify the input of that data, so they're doing the input work for you. But then you can connect that in real time to your back-end systems, and it means you can do uh, your AML checks, your K KYC checks, all automatically, all in real time, without any involvement from your knowledge workers, direct interaction with your customer. You then have the touch screen, where you can sign, You've got the location of the device, you know the device, the transaction can be completed in its entirety from start to finish on the mobile device. Are there any issues around that, for example, with let's say I've got a, um, a photocopy of my driving licence and I've say take a photograph of that in order to verify who I am as opposed to my original one? Sure. Well, y you're right. That it, it does seem that at first, a, uh, first example that you could perhaps just you know, have a picture of somebody and then use that. But there are ways and means around this. So um, if you take the Lloyds Bank example, they'll get somebody to you know, turn left or turn right. Um, you can get people, if you're using um, eye recognition, you can basically get them to look up, look left, look right, based on a command which comes from the phone. And, and that, to a certain extent, will uh, reduce the, the risk of fraud. You can also um, use other biometric means uh, as well in order to um, verify the individual. And there, there are certain things such as um, a passport. Does it have rounded corners? Is the watermark there? So there are, there are ways and means to check these things now that make the, the security risk of using a mobile phone very, very small indeed. And all these various biometric areas, how does that play onto the customer experience? Because is it relatively seamless as well, as well as being secure? Well, I think customers all accept now that they have to be ID'd, you know, even if you're phoning um, you know, your local council to change your council tax, they will ask you for three pieces of information to verify your ID. Anything which speeds up that process is a good thing. So if you're using biometrics like the fingerprint on an iPhone, for example, it makes the customer experience faster and it takes them back to that one-click Amazon-style experience that just makes things faster. I caught up with Pariah's Bank to speak a little bit more about this subject. Yeah. Only really over the last two years you've been focused on the digital side of things. Does you, have you found that that's given you an advantage, being able to look back at what other people have done and in some cases failed at when it comes to things like mobile banking? What is critical we've realised is that you need to follow the technological innovations and advantages but at the same time, if you are a follower, you overinvest without knowing why. The competitive advantage I believe we have created is that we keep the balance between monitoring the innovations and the, the technological advancements. At the same time, we monitor where our customers are and how far we can go to leverage their capability and which are the priority investments we have to make 
as regards user experience, customer experience, simplicity of uh, mobile platforms uh, or the new technologies such as, as the virtual cashier that I mentioned that will allow us to be innovative, useful for the customers, but they, at the same time we will ensure the profitability. And in terms of uh, well, profitability and relevance to the services, I'm sure one of the biggest costs for you guys is your branch network. Mm -hmm. But what role do you see the physical branches have in the future? And why is it still important to have that, that physical face-to-face? -face? Uh, definitely the role of the physical network is going to be uh, mainly advisory for complicated uh, investment, lending, uh, uh, and other advisory uh, services needed by our, our individuals and the small businesses and professionals. At the same time, our physical network is going to continue to be a training, let's say, center for our customers for every innovative digital or not digital services we want to explain to them uh, through a human uh, perspective. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we are aspired to be so uh, well designed and homely uh, spaces that uh, will make it very convenient and uh, uh, very nice for the customers to come. And at the same time, we are developing tools uh, through iPads, tablets, etc., for our people within the branches that are going to enable them to leave the branch and go close to the customer, either to the affluent uh, doctor or to the small business in this touristic hotel, etc., and uh, finalize the advice, even the transaction service, on the spot. So, the branch network, apart from being uh, the main advisory and sales uh, point, the main training uh, point, is going to be the main uh, uh, spot from which our people and advisors are going to visit and go uh, closely to the customers, the most uh, profitable and high potential and more demanding and sophisticated customers to finalize the advice and work at their point of uh, uh, work. With a vast amount of new regulations coming in, I was curious to find out what some of the advantages could be. So it, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, so the digital transformation journey is a long one. And like all journeys, you take them one step at a time. So where we're seeing success is where small, multi-discipline teams are being set up and they work uh, on small challenges and solve small challenges and you work through the whole of the organization one small step at a time. So if you look at systems of record, they are owned and run by IT. If you look at the business process, it's owned and run by the business. This is why bringing together multidiscipline teams that may be empowered um, by IT to make change to systems, but also empowered by the business to make change to process and to make change to customer engagement are very powerful. Many organizations have got heads of innovation. Very often they're blue sky thinkers, they're very clever people, um, they often have an entrepreneurial background, but they don't empower them. So where it's been successful is where heads of innovation are given power, they're given money to invest, and they're allowed to create small teams that then tackle small manageable problems. So you select your problem very carefully. So let's take onboarding for a new product. Um, it touches many parts of your back-end systems, and um, there's potential to interact through the internet, through a branch, or through perhaps a mobile device. Take a multidiscipline team where it's empowered by the business. It has the power of IT to change back-end systems, and it has the power of the business and the empowerment to make change in the business. Find a problem, solve it, improve it, automate it, and then move on to the next one. And do that one step at a time. And where we've seen success is when um, you set achievable goals in a very short space of time, deliver against those goals, and then word gets out into the organization very quickly. And what you then find is that the rest of the business will come to you asking you to automate their processes. We are seeing 
God knows how many regulations coming into the fray, like PSD2, GDPR, over the, over the next few months. Why is this a, a positive thing? I, what's some of the advantages for you guys in, in, in these regulations coming in? The advantage is that through destabilizing the taken for given that you are the, the only provider, service provider uh, for the customers, through creating competition that fintechs and other kind of organizations can plug in their uh, smarter and better customer experience systems in your central systems, give you the appetite and creates the engagement to identify the best practices, what uh, smaller and more agile organizations have adopted in terms of customer experience and see what you can adopt or which of the fintechs you want to embrace uh, if it is relevant in order to stay relevant to the total customer experience. Uh, and uh, definitely we are not uh, the kind of uh, banking organizations that we want to become the back end uh, of all the fintechs and the new organizations that are going to keep the immediate relationship with the customer. So this gives us the drive to innovate uh, and to experiment more with the new kind of solutions. And it also allows a level of uh, openness so that you can plug in, in some cases, some back office solutions as well. Uh, exactly. It allows you to systemize even your legacy systems uh, to see how you bring up to a point that you open up in a systematic way to different kinds of solutions. And this gives a flexibility not only for the external providers, but also for the digital professionals within the same bank uh, that want to create different ecosystems with other retailers, not only fintechs, in order to ensure that they have the optimum uh, uh, service to the customer. There's obviously the op opening stuff up to be able to bring, to bring various things in, and that's obviously very, I can see some of the, the positive of, of that. Um, but then on the flip side, in, is it May, you've got the data regulation, the GDPR one coming in. Is, is that something that you can leverage to again deliver a stronger customer experience by being able to manage customer data effectively? Yes, this is a clear advantage. Uh, for example, we have developed uh, very important skills over the past six, seven years as regards the customer intelligence and the use of data and how uh, uh, we use it not only internally, but we're preparing to show this data to, through digital and physical channels to our customers in order to facilitate and accelerate their financial planning and options. Um, so from this perspective, uh, through this regulation, since you have the ability to aggregate the financial data that your customers have, uh, if the customer agrees to do this in other institutions, you will have an even richer database in order to escalate what you can deliver to your customer. New technologies bring new challenges. And one of the key issues at the moment is regulation, GDPR, PSD2. What are Ulster Bank doing to make this a, a positive change rather than a negative one? The temptation for banks, if we take PSD2, uh, certainly historically has been to focus on being compliant. The big winners from PSD2 are customers. If we just focus on being compliant, I think we miss the major strategic opportunities that certainly exist. There are challenges and complexities, but the opportunities, in my view, are much greater. So our job actually here is, yes, to be compliant, but in doing so, working out actually how do we want to use PSD2 and open banking to provide new services and, and products and platforms to our customers. And we in Ulster Bank are, are delighted to be able to say that we have launched uh, and have developed an Ulster Bank API. It's Ireland's first open API in response to this uh, change in banking, in response to open banking. And it effectively uh, provides a mechanism for fintechs and third parties to develop products, and new applications, to provide services to our customers. And it does that by enabling a secure, seamless access from a third party to our customers' data. And in this case, the data in question is account balance in the last six transactions, for example. But to be really clear, we would 
never share customers' data with anybody without the customer's express consent to do so. But what we have built here is a capability to turn PSD2 and open banking from a hypothetical, uh, in some ways um, theoretical concept into something that is real and that we will now start to develop relationships with third parties to determine if they're the third parties with the right credentials and trustworthiness that we want to access our API portal. And if they are, and if our customers give their express consent to share their information with those third parties, we can now create the mechanism to do that. And that's a first in Ireland in banking, and we're very proud and we're very excited by the various opportunities and services and products that that will open up for ourselves and for our customers. On the next episode of Fintech Finance, we're taking a little look at security.